Gray, I want to thank you for coming here. Uh, all the darlings and dudes, I want to introduce you to the wonderful Graydon Clark. Um, you know, I, I posted earlier, friend, mentor, and uh, boy, producer extraordinaire. Thank you, Derby. Thank you. Oh, well, listen, I, I went back and I reread your book. And I actually took a little slack online because I said, because I'm dyslexic, I don't like to read. So that's yeah. not a big thing of mine. But I just love going back and reading your book and all the inside stories and all the people and friends we had in common. And I now found out why I didn't get a couple of the parts. <laughs> well, actually, I think you're wrong in that case, because every time I thought of you, with one exception, every time I thought of you, I offered you the job and you were grateful enough to think it, to you're say right. and and what the lapses, and when I couldn't, when you were getting taken off to Malta, yeah. right, to do yeah. that one, and you said, Darb, I'm sorry, there's just nothing in it. We're on a boat, yeah. <laughs> right. and there's just no other characters. Right. And I said, can I please come and shadow you and be your AD and just, uh, you know, learn that side of it? And I was very excited to do it. I pass by the building all the time where you had the offices, and I think about that. And I was writing out call sheets and getting to go through. One of the fun things I got to do was I came in and I was sitting in the outer office and you were doing some of the casting. And then I just sat down like one of the actors and I listened to all the actors talk and what was going on and everything else. And then when you were ready to bring people in, I'm like, oh, excuse me. And I went in with you. Yeah, and you could tell they were just shocked that I was already in there and, and knew what they were saying and like, yeah, this is a person you probably don't want to take to Malta if they're pulling out the SAG book. And, yes. Uh, but anyway, and unfortunately, I didn't get to go out with you on that trip because that's right when my mom took a very bad turn yeah. and I had to fly to Hawaii and uh, and take care of her for a while. But well, Speaking of your mother, let me uh, direct you into how we first met, if that would be okay. That would be fine. Okay. It was 1967. Darby, I think, would have been, what, 10 years old? Okay, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, and I had uh, I'd been in Hollywood for a couple of years and uh, struggling as an actor. Very unsuccessful. And uh, I met a guy who was going to do a picture. And I asked him if I could be around his office. And you know, he said, I can't pay you. I said, that's okay. I'll work for free. Oh, okay. You're in. <laughs> so, so, uh, uh, I was there and they, they did make that picture. I had one line, but it got me into SAG. And the one line was to an Academy Award winner, Broderick Crawford. And I played a young FBI agent. Uh, I was sitting behind him at a desk. He was in the foreground at a desk. And he said, hand me that file. And I said, yes, sir. And handed it to him and got me into SAG. Anyhow, a year later, uh, I had written a script that I showed this guy. It was a Western. And uh, uh, we were going to film it in Spain. Uh, the Italian Westerns were primarily filmed, actually, in Spain. So uh, there was a part, a major part, of a young kid uh, 10 years old or so and uh, a guy came in the office and he knew Marilyn Hinton and he said how about her son Darby and I said you mean the kid from Daniel Boone he said yes yeah. he'd be terrific it'd be great could we get him well so we gave this guy this middle guy the script and he gave it to Mrs. Hinton and a couple of days later he called and said, Marilyn Hinton would like to meet with you. Now, I was not directing. I was hoping to do a part as an actor, but I had written the script. So the director said, okay. And he wanted me to go with him to meet Mrs. Hinton. So we drive to uh, Bel Air, I think. I'm not absolutely certain. One, two, three, four, Bel Air Road. Really? Okay. Yep. So we go in there and it's a beautiful home. Uh, right next to, I think, uh, George Cukor's home. And there's this little kid jumping in and out of a swimming pool. 
And a cute little kid. And I thought this guy would be wonderful for the park. In, in the living room. Yes, in there was an indoor swimming, swimming pool. pool. And uh, I had never seen an indoor swimming In fact, I had never been in a house worth more than probably $25,000. Uh, uh, what am I saying? 25, probably 15. So anyhow, uh, we met Mrs. Hinton. She was the most charming uh, uh, woman. And, and she said, Who's going to do the lead, the sheriff that uh, kind of is the uh, 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 surrogate father to the boy that Darby was going to play? And we said, we don't know. We've, we've got to get it to somebody. She, she said, would you mind if I showed it to Robert Taylor? Well, Robert Taylor was a major star. He had been uh, uh, at MGM as a contract player longer than any other actor in their entire history. And uh, he was not by any means a small time player. He was a major, major star. So anyhow, jumping forward, she got the script to Robert Taylor. And uh, believe it or not, he liked it. This was the first script I'd ever written. He liked it. So Robert Taylor asked, could, would the director come to meet him at his home in Mal uh, Mandeville Canyon? And the director was kind of a shy guy. I don't know if that makes much sense for a director, but anyhow, he asked me to go with him. So the two of us went to see Robert Taylor. He had a beautiful home, a huge ranch style home uh, in Mandeville Canyon. And uh, we talked a bit and he had some questions and the director kept deferring to me as the writer to answer his questions. Make a long story short, Taylor agreed to do the movie. So we had Robert Taylor, Darby Hinton, and we got three or four other name actors to do it. And would un unbelievably, maybe two months later, I was on my way to Spain and I stopped in the southwest corner of Michigan where I was born to see my family. And I was at the kitchen table and the radio was on. A news bulletin, Robert Taylor, has cancer, he's at Cedar sinai Oh my God. I mean, too bad for Mr. Taylor, but too bad for me too. <laughs> so, so anyhow. This I is Hollywood, up, okay? <laughs> yeah, I ended up going back to Los Angeles. Robert Taylor died within the year. The deal completely fell apart. Well, uh, I wrote another script and that eventually was done. And meanwhile, Darby had probably grown from 10 to 11 or 12. Now, now wait a minute, because I have to stop you right there. Okay. Because, first of all, I think I remember you two coming in and going to that round table to the right of the door that kind of overlooked all of you. Yes. And having a discussion while I was just messing around the pool. And I think later in month, oh, yeah, I think those guys. But there was a picture that I'm going to share that I came across and I remember doing it and I never knew why they had me do this. Okay, this, ah, there you go. <laughs> this picture, this was because of your movie. They wanted to see what I look like as an Indian. Yes. <laughs> and I, cause we never did it in Daniel Boone. I didn't understand why this picture was until I read your book and then I heard the whole thing and I'm like, Oh, that's why they did. And I got to tell you, I know why Ed Ames was not that happy putting all that makeup on first thing <laughs> in the morning, that wet, cold, all over your body. That can get old real quick. Yes. Well, well, the part was a little Indian boy who, who again, uh, got the sheriff, Robert Taylor, as a surrogate father. And they had a great relationship and it would have been a wonderful movie. And uh, but Mr. Taylor had to uh, end uh, when, when we visited Robert Taylor, I, I never have smoked in my life. So we visited Robert Taylor. He chain smoked the entire we were there maybe an hour. He chain smoked the entire one right after. Very nice guy. Say, oh, please call me, Bob. Uh, you know, we chatted about this and that and so forth. But he smoked constantly. And uh that sure, I'm sure contributed to his cancer and his demise. But that's funny. We went back that far. Yeah. And then the next time we met, I auditioned, I think it was for you. Yes. But didn't get it. 
Yes. Because Mike wanted Lynn. Yes. Our, uh, yeah. Not Lynn. Uh, Lane Claudel. Lane Claudel. Thank you. This was Goodbye yeah. Franklin High. And what I just noticed in getting, looking at pictures, what I wanted to do is up there next to the camera. That's Dean, right? Yes, that's Dean Cundy. Oh, my goodness. Now, I thought Dean got his start because he was like first a gripper lighting and your camera guy didn't show up. And Dean kind of went, hey, you know, that I can do that. that that's, that's basically the fact. I made a picture or was about to make a picture called Black Shampoo, which... Was it was a takeoff on Warren Beatty? Wasn't a ripoff at all, was it? <laughs> I had the sets built and we were ready to shoot. First day of shooting, I, I always got to the set at least a half hour, sometimes an hour or more before everybody else. So I would, you know, stage stuff and get things in my mind how I wanted to do it. I turn and in walks my cameraman, kind of shuffling, kind of funny. He was a young guy. I looked at him, he came over and his lip was all puffed up and bloody and his eye was half shut. And he said, great. And I had an automobile accident last night. This was before seatbelts. And he said, I got hit in the front and I, my face went forward into the steering wheel. I, his name was Michael, Michael Milan. Very nice guy. I said, oh, Michael, what are we going to do? I mean, I, he said, oh, I can, I can do, I can work well. In about a half an hour before we had run one foot of film through a camera, he came to me, he said, great. I'm sorry. I, I'm so full of pills. I can't even see straight. I can't do this. I said, oh, my God, what am I going to do? Because I had, in those days and many days, I had put my own money into these things, although it was very, very low budget, but it was everything that I had. So he said, listen, here, here's the gaffer. Come over here. And it was Dean Cundy. He said, Dean can shoot it for you. I said, the gaffer is going to be the DP? Oh, yeah, he can do it. So I asked Dean, I said, have you ever shot anything? He said, well, I've forgotten if he had gone to USC or UCLA. He said, I shot some stuff in college. I said, well, okay. I mean, what choice do we have? Uh, we're going to have to work. So he shot that. And then he shot seven films in a row for me. Uh, and later he became Steven Spielberg's cameraman. Huge yeah. hook. Just, he had Academy John nominations. Carpenter's, right? For Halloween? Jurassic Park, yes, yes. Halloween is where Halloween he took off when he did it. I didn't realize that was him. Yeah, and he, he was a wonderful, wonderful guy to work with. I mean, I, I hired him every film I did until he became such a big star that he couldn't do low-budget films anymore. But anyhow, so... I, I remember. I remember you told me though. You called him once. I think we were talking during Star Games or something, and you said, "Yeah, you know, I called Dean and said, how you doing?'" He goes, "Oh, you know, it's just about the same.'" And he said, "Come on, really?" Because he worked out of his truck. I mean, that was the camera truck. Yes. And then you look at a Spielberg production, and the whole block has trucks. Yes. Um, yes. Whatever they could. Yeah, there's a little bit of difference. Yeah, actually, Darby. He called me while he was shooting uh, Back to the Future, part one. He shot one, two, and three. He called me out of the blue. I hadn't talked to him in, I don't know, five or six years at least. And, uh, Graydon, how are you? Oh, fine, Dean. And so I'm so proud of, of uh, what you've done in your career. I take credit for it every chance I get. So, so uh, I said, what's it like to work on a real movie? Because our, our crews were 10 people, maybe. And his crews at that time were 150, 200 people. He said, oh, it's about the same. There's not much to it. I said, Dean, we shot these movies in 10 days. <laughs> he said, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, it is, it is different what I do now. <laughs> yeah, let me go back to Darby. All right. So I got a chance to do a picture, a script that I had written called Satan's Cheerleaders. Don't you love these titles, incidentally? Uh, and I wanted Darby uh, because I, I had kind of followed his career a little bit. And by that time, he was a teenager or a, maybe early 20s. Uh, and I wanted Darby. So I called his agent and got him to come in for an interview. And I really liked him. I was ready to cast him. 
But my producer and friend, a guy named Mike McFarlane, he was getting ready to do a musical. And he was going to cast a, an actor named Lane Caudell. And he asked me as a favor to him if I would cast Lane in the role that I was going to cast Darby in. And because he wanted to see some film footage on Lane. I That's said, Lane. Yeah. So I said, okay, so I cast Lane. Uh, the, the picture did well. To, uh, yeah, there's Lane on the camera right. Is that me, Darby? No. You know, no, that's a woman. Sorry. Well, that's my sister. Oh, your sister. Pride. Okay. I'm trying to think who that is behind him. I, I, I'm I, not sure. Maybe he oh. was in the movie. Yeah, it's Dean Cundy on the uh, crane. Definitely. And, and probably Ray Liotta, his, his operating uh, man. So I did that picture, and I was lucky enough to get another picture, another picture. To me, a successful picture, in those days especially, was if it made enough money to allow me to do another picture. So I wrote a script called High Riders, and I wrote it specifically for Darby. I, again, got in contact with Darby, I'm sure through his agent, had him come in. I probably had him read, but I didn't really need him to read because, as I say, I had written it for Darby. Well, why not put him through the agony of reading anyway? <laughs> so uh, so I cast him in that. That was the first film I really cast him in. It was 1977, which incidentally was 10 years exactly from 1967 when I first met Darby. And Darby was not only a wonderful actor full of ideas and thoughts and took direction beautifully, but he was a wonderful guy to work with. He was always on time. He knew his lines. He was cooperating, uh, cooperative with the other actors. Uh, I loved working with Darby and I loved Darby as a human being. So I, the next five pictures, I want to say four pictures, uh, I had Darby in him as, in his biggest parts as I could possibly find for it. He was the lead in High Riders, and it was a car action film where street racers would, would race one another. And, and, and Darby was a uh, curly haired, blonde, good looking kid who, uh, in the story, came to Los Angeles with a girlfriend. Uh, Diane Peterson was the actress playing it. She was also wonderful to work with uh, from San Diego to see if they could hustle street racing uh, guys and make money. So he did that, but he got involved with a tough uh, high riders gang of street racers. Guys looking for a little action. This is high rider country. Don't be coming around here with some slow ass firebird expect to run with us. You could just lose it all. Listen, high rider. You think you're so good? Still think this is fun? Nobody beats us, and nobody's as smart ass to us. Get me? High lift cam, 11.5 to 1 compression ratio, Mallory ignition. To new friends. To new friends. Want some help with those things? I bet you just died if I say yes. Into our town, kill our kids. It was an accident. It's time to pack. We'll just sing. <laughs> I found it. The road is the way. Watch out, Kiki's gonna shoot. And the way is clear. They just.
just trying to kill us. Kill you? Who? I want that link. Not one penny until that frog is blasted. Well, well, that's what we got here. Turn around. Now you're going to kill me, is that it? And when I was first writing this story, I thought, well, Darby's my good guy, and the street racing gang is the bad guy. But as I wrote it, I started liking the idea of Darby, the clean-cut, curly-haired, blonde Adonis. How tame, times have changed, huh, Darby? So, <laughs> <laughs> okay, with that, I got to put up a picture, right? <laughs> Yeah, this was from High Riders. Yes. And what's fun is you went back and you filmed this on the Fox Ranch. Yes. So as Israel, I don't know how many times I jumped in and out of that little pond there and with yeah. those rocks and everything. Yes. But yes, that's Diane Peterson, who was the stunt woman. And uh, what do you mean? I look just like that. What are, you, what are you talking about? Of course you do. So we made that picture and it was really well received especially overseas but well received here also and uh in fact that was the first picture that i made enough money on that i stopped worrying about paying the rent <laughs> because prior to that it, it, it was my seventh picture i think no i'm sorry it was my fifth picture prior to that i was really scraping the bottom of the barrel hustling trying to get movies made. But after High Riders, I was lucky enough basically to do, I ended up directing 20 features and produced most of them and wrote most of them. So uh, from there, I was able to do another picture called Seven from Heaven slash Angels Brigade. A Angels Brigade, again, Darby played uh, a young, good-looking guy who uh, was pushing drugs on the street for Jack Palance was his boss. Bobby's lucky. He'll be okay. Some kids aren't as lucky. I shouldn't have left him with just a housekeeper. I'm talking about the men who push poison onto young kids. Something's got to be done to stop it. Every day a new drug comes along and these creeps push it onto kids. There's millions of dollars worth of drugs being processed in this building. Much of it highly explosive chemicals. We can destroy it in less than a minute. And I know the people who can help us. This is our target. Maria gets the guard's attention here. April and Keiko cut through the wire and get to the roof of this building. Michelle, Terry, and myself bust through the main gate. Darby, why don't you tell the story? I'll shut up for a while. Why don't you tell the story of the first shot you had with Jack Palance inside a car? First of all, I got to say that I hadn't really worked with you right away. I, I think I had just come back from my college ship. Yes. So I had been away at school and a lot of third world kind, like as far away from Hollywood as you could get. And I come back and Grace says, I got a great picture for you. So I'm like, okay, great. And I come in and I'm working with, you know, the great Jack Palance. And the first scene I have is we're in a car and it's all dialogue. To refresh your memory, you had ah. a scene. The first day you had a scene with Jack Palance in a car. Jack Palance, came, all dialogue, all yeah. dialogue. You came to me and you said, great. No, let me tell you what happened when I went to him. So I see Jack and he's sitting in his chair and he's going over the script. I'm like, great. And he gets to a part where he pauses. 
this is where I come over as the actor. Uh, hi, Miss Pellance. You know, we got the scene together. You know, can we go over some lines? And he slowly turns and looks up at me and goes, no. And then looks back down. And I'm like, what? In my 20 years, I've, I've never had an actor say no. Everybody's usually anxious to go over lines and make sure you got everything. And I'm like, oh my, what, huh, what do I do? So then I go to Gray and I told him that. That, and and he said, well, you know, maybe his boss, but he stayed that way with me the whole time. And then finally, it was like, you know, we'd shot it and gone back and forth and we're in the car. And then we we're finally turning around and we're coming back in the car. He goes, you know, I was great friends with your dad. I really like your mom, too. They're really great people. You know, I'm like what? What? He's being nice to me. He's talking to me. But. What you said, Gray, is yeah, he was just in character. He was my boss. He was supposed to be intimidating me. We had he had to intimidate me without a gun because the prop lady took off with the gun. Yeah. The prop truck. Well, that that's that's absolutely fact what Darby just said. The uh, I did two pictures of the Jack Palance, both of which had Darby in them. The first one, Darby and Jack had a lot of scenes together because Jack was his boss. And Darby was the street peddler peddling uh, drugs to little kids. And uh, uh, he, Darby came to me and he said, Jack Palance won't run lines with me. And I said, well, I don't understand. Why wouldn't he want to do that? And Darby said, I don't know, but he won't do it. So Darby went back to the car and did they, I don't know, did, did, did he ever rehearse with you or did we did we no. do it? There's Dean Cundy again on the ground. Great. Yeah, and me, me with a hat. Yep. And I don't know uh, who the clapper was, but he, there's Jack in the car. Jack's in the car, and, and Darby then gets in the car with him, and off they go. And you know, a little uh, a little side story, which I don't think I've ever told anyone. Believe it or not, when I first went to Los Angeles, I lived in an apartment building in one of those two houses up there, two apartments. That was my uh, uh, beginnings in Los Angeles. Oh, and one of these apartments in the yeah. back? Yeah, and it was it was totally coincidence. All right, so, so anyhow, we did that picture and uh, Darby being the bad guy, uh, we had to kill him off. I devised a scene where Darby realizes he's in trouble with Jack Palance and he runs away and he thinks he can get away by running up the side of a building and getting on the roof of a building. Well, Palance sees him go up there. So he follows him up. We're up on the roof of the building and I'm staging the scene. Palance is moving and Darby's moving and back and forth. And uh, I had written that Jack reaches into his pocket and pulls out a gun a gun. So we're up there and I look down and there goes the prop department driving away from the location with the gun in it. Oh my God. We didn't have cell phones in those days. What are we going to do? Well, I sent somebody going as fast as they could, but I was on a very tight schedule. No, and not Graydon Clark. <laughs> and I said to Jack and Darby, I said, guys, I don't have a gun. I don't know what to do. And Palo says, I'll tell you what to do. I'll just make a motion toward inside my jacket like I'm going for my gun. And then Darby, you react because you know what I'm going to do. So that's the way we solved it. There was no gun, but there was the threat of Palance getting a gun and Darby backs up and he actually falls off the side of the building. And uh, Grain doesn't want to tell it, but I'll tell it. So decades later, Gray and I are driving down that street. I don't know why, but we're driving, and she goes, oh, she goes, yeah, I remember that, that building over there. I said, God, you know, I hung an actor off the roof of that building with no <laughs> fall pad or anything else. You know, can you believe the actor was dumb enough to do that? And I look, I said, well, I don't know. It kind of sounds like fun. <laughs> Gray slowly turns and looks and goes, Darby, it was you. <laughs> we had now, Darby strapped with the hidden uh, secure wrist gri gri grippings 
of cables and what have you, but he actually hung off the edge of the building. Now he could let his hands go and he'd still been totally safe, but he hung off the end of the building looking up and, and Palace just smiles and I think he steps on Darby's hands. And then we cut to a stunt man, Darby, I didn't have you do the actual fall. Uh, we cut to a stunt man who falls and we had a hidden bag for him and so forth. And to my, um, I don't know, saving grace or whatever the reason why, your movie starts on time. Graydon has a schedule, it sticks to it. And that's when it, I was doing a movie before called Do It in the Dirt. And no, it was not a porno. It was a motorcycle movie, <laughs> but it was called Do It in the Dirt. And it had gone, you know, a week into it or something. The producer put all the money on the wrong team in the Super Bowl <laughs> and, it sh and he lost. And we shut down production for weeks and weeks and weeks till I could get. Anyway, it ran into it. I was doing night shoots out there at, uh, what did they used to call that? Uh, next to Magic Mountain and all, where every, all of the military things were shot. Indian Dunes, right? Um, I was doing night shoots out there, leaving the set, coming home, showering, changing clothes, and then driving to Graydon's set and working all day there. And I did that for like three days and I literally got a little loopy. But um, I thought at the time, I'm such in demand, look at this. That's right, well, you were. <laughs> well, I don't, yeah, but it would have, anyway, it, it yeah. did help the performances, I don't think. Be it how, the only sleep I was getting was in the trailers between shots. Darby, do you, do you have any more photos from Seven from Heaven, Angels Brigade? Yes, I do, as a matter of fact. I have a question. Was that, that the movie about the van? Yes. The van that you ended up with, yeah. Darby? Yes. That's the van. That Oh, I should have had a picture of the van. That I sold to my sister and her band, Striper, who were the soldiers for God. They're the, you know, they're the Christian heavy metal band. And they put their yellow stripes on in, buy a stripes for your yield. And that, and that van is now has collector models being made in the Orient because Striper became so big and used it on their album cover and everything else. But here's one of the things Graydon did to me. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> and Seven from Heaven. <laughs> yeah, that's real torture. That's every man's torture, I'm sure, Darby. <laughs> Listen. I got to tell you, being hung up upside down for a long time, you all of a sudden go, uh, guys, <laughs> and you're never quite sure about the ladies and how well they are with the swords. The story was that, as I said, Darby was the guy pushing the drugs and uh, a gang of seven beautiful women uh, were trying to clean up the neighborhood. So they captured Darby and they were trying to torture him to make him tell him where who Jack Palance was and where he was. So uh, Darby was good. I, I, I if you ask the Darby, word torture lightly here. Yeah. In quotes. <laughs> if, if you ask Darby to do anything as an actor, he would just say, okay, how does this look? And he would do it. He was he was great to work with. You know, I noticed you left the story out. You did talk about one of the other actresses that you had a challenge with. But you did leave out the story about the blonde in this one. Correct me. The, and Ginger will love all this because, you know, I just did a movie with Ginger's husband and Ginger. Oh, she was mentioning that. And, yes. You, and you get along great with her hubby. Anyway, didn't weren't you about a week into the shooting of this when your leading blonde somehow saw the dailies and then came to the shot like the next day with her hair cut? Because she thought she would look better this way than she did in the dailies. Yes, yes, that's true. Uh, <laughs> and, and of course, we were not shooting in sequence because no. on a low budget movie, you jumble everything up so that you could you could quit filming in a location, even though the, the location may occur five or six different times in the movie. You film it all in a half a day or one day or whatever the case may be. So one day, about a week into the shoot, I walk on the set and up comes this actress. She looks different. I said, well, how are you different? 
she, 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 she said, oh, nothing really. And she went to makeup. Well, the, the hair lady came to me immediately and she said, she's cut her hair. She, she, she looks different. I said, she did what? So, so I go into the makeup trailer, uh, makeup and hair. And uh, I say to her, how did you, why would you ever cut? We've already been filming. Nothing is going to match. And she said, match? What do you mean? So anyhow, the, the hair person did a miraculous job in finding what are they call falls and stuff to, to match as best we can. Now, I can always tell, oh, that was done after her hair was cut or that was done before her hair was cut. But uh, inexperienced actors, see, when I got Darby the first time, he'd done hours and hours and hours and hours and hours, weeks and months and years of filming. So he was nothing inexperienced, wouldn't begin to uh, describe him. But throughout my career, many times I had to cast, uh, let's say, first timers. And, and sometimes that worked out wonderful. And sometimes it was disastrous. And this with the haircutting was one of the lesser times that I had on the set. You know, we should say one other thing about this, that the two ladies in this, two of the ladies from this, the two Greer girls, went on and wrote that book, You'll Never Sleep in This Town Again. Yeah. So if, if yeah, you're wondering he, who the yeah. authors are, yeah, there they were. The, the young girl, I had her in High Riders too. Uh, and then, then, then she played a teenage girl, a high school girl in Seven from Heaven Angels Brigade. The other girl, her sister, her older sister, uh, Robin. Robin. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, Robin, uh, she lived a better life than her sister. Uh, she had a couple of television series that she was on and what have you. She's the one who cut her hair, incidentally. Uh, Robin was? Yeah. I thought it was the blonde. No, well, and I got to be careful. Robin might have come on this tonight. I don't know. She is one of my Facebook friends. Well, she's uh, uh, her her father was very helpful to me in my career. He he worked on a number of my films, and uh, he was a twin brother to Jane Greer, the fabulous actor from the '40s and '50s in all kinds of noir films. But anyhow, so Angels Brigade, Darby was in. I want to compliment Graydon for being so um, diversified at a time. It was long before its popularity, which of course now it is. But I noticed in that picture of the seven women, black woman, Asian woman, white woman, you had a very nice, a blonde, a brunette, a, a very nice diversification. Because I always tell my husband, you need to be able to tell them apart so that people can pick up which one they kind of like per se. Absolutely. And, it was and, nice to see you had a very diversified cast yeah. as far as that you, went. You are talking to the man that did write and shoot Black Shampoo and another title that we can't even say these days. Well, The Bad Bunch is now, it's called. The, the, yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, now it's, it's a bad bunch. The huh? Bad Bunch. <laughs> the Bad Bunch. It was a black exploitation film. That he named something much different, but back then, well, there was no uh, problem. Uh, it really is, believe it or not, one of my favorite films, although the film was shot in less than 10 days, uh, because it's a, I'm a very liberal guy uh, with race relations and politics and what have you. Anyhow, it's a statement of hopefully getting the young black community to identify more with the young white community and, and the vice versa being true. And uh, unfortunately, uh, it, it, it doesn't have a particularly happy ending. But You'll have to read the book and you yeah. should read the book. Yeah. It's great. All right, yeah. we're gonna move on because, you know, I wanna talk about I'll be stuff here all that night, I do. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now, we get to talk about my favorite next. I which one? Really like, without warning. Yes, out warning. <laughs> Flying frisbees. This is actually one of my favorites. You know, uh, I finished Seven from Heaven slash Angels Brigade, 
And it did fairly well, not as well as High Riders, but it did enough that I could go on and make my next movie. Well, my friend, Mike McFarland, who Darby worked for on at least one, maybe two films, uh, uh, he came to me and he said, I'm not gonna do any of these, any more of these low budget films. It, they're just too damn difficult to do. But I have a script that you might be interested in, Greg. I said, sure, Mike, show me. So he gave me the script to Without Warning. And it had a premise of an alien hunter coming to Earth to kill human beings for sport. And I love that concept. And this was before Predator. This yes. Before oh, yes. Predator. Before Predator. I liked that part of the script, but none of the rest of the script did I like. So I started doing rewrites and I came up with these little flying frisbee creatures that the uh, hunter would use to kill his prey. And uh, Dean Cundy had on Angels and Brigade, Seven from Heaven, I'm jumping around here a bit, but back to that film, Dean Cundy shot that for me. And at the end of the shoot, he said to me, Graydon, I think I'm going to have to get out of the business. I said, what are you talking about? You're the best cinematographer in the world, and you do these two- and three-week pictures for me. How could you think that? He said, well, I'm not making any money, and my wife, you know, I don't have any health insurance. I, I don't have this. I don't, I, he said, I just don't think I can continue. I said, oh, my God. And I thought to myself, if Dean Cundy can't continue to work in this business, what about me? I'll never work again. <laughs> So, so anyhow, I get this script from Mike McFarland without warning, and I do major rewrites on it, what have you. And at that time, I want to say that was 1979. Were you then uh, having difficulty with your mother and going to Hawaii, Derby? I think I was 79. I think I was on the ship again. Ah, Okay. There was some reason that you couldn't do the lead, which right. disappointed me greatly because you would have been far superior to the kid who did it. But anyhow, you were not available. Uh, I made that picture. I called Dean. I said, Dean, you know, I've got this script. I'm going again. Well, between Angel's Brigade and Without Warning, Dean made Halloween. Great picture for John Carpenter, the director, great director. Great picture, wonderful cinematography. And suddenly, Dean was a commodity. Uh, in our business, it, well, within reason, what I'm going to say, don't take it fully, doesn't make any difference if you're good or bad. If you have a hit, yeah. if you have a hit, the, the, the suits say, oh, Dean Cundy shot uh, Halloween? Oh, let's get him do our next major studio picture. So I called Dean and say, Dean, I got a picture. He said, great. And I'm sorry, I can't do it. He said, I have an agent now after Halloween. And my agent says, I can't do any more three week pictures. I said, oh, well, Dean, I understand. I understand. Let me send you the script. I'd like your input. Nevertheless, because I, I valued him as a filmmaker. I sent him the script. A couple of days later, he calls and he says, this is a pretty good script. I said, yeah, I, I think it has potential. He said, how are we going to do those little flying creatures? Because it's at <laughs> night. And I heard, how are we going to do those? <laughs> and I said, Dean, we'll do them any way you tell me to do them. So he came up with a way to have them reflecting light as they move through the dark uh, as, as sky at, the, at night in the woods. The hunting season has begun, but the hunter isn't human. Only the prey are. It came without warning, like nothing on this earth. Our friends are dead. Beyond any known terror. It's all a horrible creature. Come on, come on. They're chasing me. Because when it leaves this planet, no one may be left alive. Look, I'm warning you. When they start eating on you, don't come to me for help. <laughs> it's crazy. 
baby. He came down here with a spot. He wants to get himself a few trophies. You know what? Right now, you and me, we are the prize game. The hunter. The hunted. That was no dream. The thing that preys on human fear and feeds on human flesh. From deepest space it came, and now man is the endangered species. It came without warning, and now it's coming for you. I contacted Jack Palance. Now, you, you never know as a director whether the actor wants to work with you again because, you know, you're not paying him anywhere near the amount of money that he was used to getting. And I thought, well, you know, he, I think we had a good time filming it. We didn't have any blow-ups, really. So I get him the script, and uh, he calls back. He says, great, I'll do it, but you got to give me 10,000 more than I got on the last one. Okay, Jack, fine. So through a series of pure luck, and in my book, incidentally, I talk about luck all the time. The, the opening line in my book on the cheap is I was born lucky. And the closing line was you might get lucky, I did. So luck plays a tremendous, tremendous factor in certainly my career and I think most people's. Luck, timing, and talent, right? Yeah. In yeah. that order. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so Jack Pallets agreed to do it. I had found some investors, some oil people out of Denver, and I raised $150,000. Pallets wanted 50000 and then I got Martin Landau, who wanted 25000 So they took half of my budget. So I only had $75,000 left to make the entire movie. Anyhow, <clears throat> I shot the picture. It really went well. I was very pleased with the picture. But I was able to save two sequences. So by this time, I had heard Darby was back in town. So I called Darby. I said, Darby, remember that picture I wanted you to do without warning? Well, I still have one day of filming. I need you for half a day. Will you do it? He said, great. Of course, I'll do it. Do you want to read the script? No, I'll do it because you want me to do it. What a great guy, right? So, so anyhow, I got Darby for half a day. And oh, I love it. And you did, you did preface at the time. You said, listen. You're going to die right away. I, I just got to tell you that. But you're, you're going to be there with um, uh, Cameron, Cameron Mitchell. Mitchell. You're going to be there with Cameron Mitchell. And he said, I really want this for the opening because I want everybody to think that you two are going to carry the picture. Right. And be all the way through the picture. And all of a sudden, you guys get killed in the first scene. Then nobody knows who's going to come and go, which I loved. I love the idea of it. Absolutely, that's that's the Janet Lee character in Psycho. You know, she she was a big star. She was in the first twenty minutes. You're following her, and then bam, she's killed. Hitchcock said, "Now they won't know who's next." Or Drew Barrymore in Scream. Everybody was shocked. When yeah, she exactly. Cried, scream exactly. at the beginning. <laughs> so you were mad before your Dar time there, Darby. I had Darby for half a day. We were shooting out at the Paramount Ranch where we had filmed High Riders and where we had filmed Angel's Brigade. Darby is playing the son of Cameron Mitchell. And Cameron doesn't like his son and he's trying to make him more of a, a hunter, a rough style guy. And, you know, he bangs on the cabin where Darby is and out they come and they're, they're off going hunting or what have you. And, uh, uh, so this little flying thing, the first time we see it, it's flying toward Cameron Mitchell and it goes on the side of his face and starts eating through and what have you. And Darby, to protest his father wanting to hunt and kill animals, had emptied his shotgun of the two shells. <laughs> so, 
So he snaps the shotgun back. He's not going to shoot anything like that. And then suddenly he sees his father coming up to him with this thing chewing on his face. So he raises his gun. He points it. Click, click. Ah, Darby's done. I'll tell you a quick story about Cameron Mitchell. I don't think it's out of school because he's no longer with us. Cameron Mitchell's agent said to me, great. I know you're paying him for one day. I've forgotten. I want to say it was a thousand dollars give or take. And Cameron's going to ask you for the cash the moment you see him. Don't give it to him because he's a, a gambler and he will lay it on the ponies. And I've promised his wife that I won't let him do that anymore. Okay. So time comes. I'm on the set. Cameron pulls up. He has a driver with him. And he gets out of his car. He walks over to me. He says, uh, you great Clark? Yes, sir. I'm your director. He said, give me my money. <laughs> I said, I, 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 I promised your agent I wouldn't do that. He said, look, do you want me to work today or not? Give me the goddamn money or I'm getting in the car and leaving. Well, the hell with the agent. I said, <laughs> to him, I, I said I'll tell you what. I'll give you 500 now and I'll give you 500 cash at the end of the day. He said, okay. So I gave him 500. He gave it to his driver, his partner. Shoom, off he goes. I'm sure to lay a bet someplace. And Cameron was uh, was easy to work with, cooperative. Did you like him, Darb? Yeah, I mean, he was fine. Here was my thing with the movie. Graydon said, now, at some point, your face is going to get eaten away. We've got to make a life mask and all it that. Did. You might like, no, no, no. But I made a deal with Christ, but I got to keep the mask. I said, afterwards, you know, after they do and stuff, I would love to have the mask. It'd be a fun thing to have in my collection. So I went <laughs> and had it all done. And, you know, the straws up the nose. They probably have different textures all over his face. But I went and hold on. Let me share this. Went and saw this thing. And I looked at it and it <laughs> freaked me out. It was oh, in person. Crazy. It was. I mean, I was looking at myself with the eye socket all gone and everything and stuff. And I was like, "Get that gross thing away from me! I don't want to have anything to do with it." Darby, oh, it really, Darby. You never looked better. <laughs> yeah, they got the mustache right anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Here, here's, here's, I think, another little close up of it. Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness it was so that was not ever in my collection well i wish i you know i don't know what happened to any of that stuff i was off to the next one i should have saved everything but i didn't anyhow tell that story the jack palance david caruso story okay if you'd like to hear it i'll be happy to tell you. <laughs> I like that story for those of you who don't know david caruso is he's the redheaded guy from CSI Miami. Yes. And NYPD. Wait a minute. Yeah, He's that guy. <laughs> Graydon had him in his very first movie. Yes, his first and movie. And who's, wait a minute, and, and please do tell that story. But just the young actors that Graydon has had come into his office and do. You had one other actor who came on to be a huge television star who you thought, I don't know what he was trying to do. And, and he was not that great of an actor in your. You know who I'm talking about? I don't, but fill me in. Anyway, all right, go on and tell your other story. And oh, I'll have to you're it. talking about a guy I did not hire. Right. Yes, yes. Uh, he's on uh, Blacklist what? now. He's a star. Blacklist, right. Oh, James Spader? Yes, James Spader. Really? That's that's a movie I'm going to talk about next. Okay. Which, which is, oh, I'm sorry. Let, I didn't mean to skip over David Caruso. So okay. let's go back to casting without warning. Darby was not available for the lead. Uh, uh, six weeks, eight weeks later, I got him for one day where he was with Cameron Mitchell. But for the body of the show, in walks this kid with shocking red hair, white skin, uh, kind of had an attitude about him. And uh, he had never worked before. And I said, uh, well, you know, would you read for me? Yeah, okay. Yeah. So I gave him the sides. That, that's the scene that they read. And uh, 
he read, and uh, I used to take notes uh, one through 10 on how they looked, would they fit the part physically, and one through 10, how they acted. So, uh, you know, I'd, I'd write it on the back of their one share, back of their photo. So <laughs> he came in and I had an assistant with me and he read and he left. And I, and I had the assistant do the same thing on one through 10. So I turned to my assistant who was with me on a lot of films, Curtis Birch, great, great, brilliant writer and editor, uh, associate producer and so on. Anyhow, so I said, Kurt, what, uh, what'd you get me? He said, well, I gave him a 10 and a 10. I said, so did I. Let's hire this kid. So I hired him first day filming. Uh, uh, he has a scene with Jack Palance in a uh, gas station, little tiny out of the way, broken down gas station. And Palance is playing a, a rough, tough, but a good guy, which he liked because he seldom got to play good guys, a rough, tough hunter who had killed a lot of animal heads that had been hung up on the wall. So he tells these kids, don't go down to the lake because the kids were on their way to the lake. They stopped to get gas. Don't go down to the lake. There's been a lot of hunting accidents down there. And the kids say, okay. So Palance is facing the camera. And I got a nice close shot of it. But in the background right behind him, <laughs> David Caruso is going like this. And Palance sees him. This is during rehearsal. Palance sees him. And remember, this is the second picture I did with Palance. He said, great. Is this kid going to be doing that while I'm doing this scene? And I said, David, what the hell are you doing? You know, it's, it's, it's Mr. Palance's close up and you're stealing it by doing crap in the background. And he said, well, I don't know. I just thought that my character would think this old man is crazy. Palance turns to him and he says, all right, do that. You think I'm crazy? Do it. So I thought, okay, well, let's see what happens. So I roll the camera. Uh, Caruso is behind him making like, you know, the crazy sign and pointing to the old man. Palace does this. And uh, so, so the kids are walking toward the exit. Palance runs to the exit, pushes him aside, slams the door. And he said, now I've warned you, don't go down to the lake. I've warned you. Okay, okay, we won't. And they push him aside and go. And of course they go down and they uh, get killed. <laughs> So that wasn't scripted for Palance to go oh, crazy no, 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 on him and no, slam no, the door. No, no. <laughs> Palance would. <laughs> Palance was a technical actor. If if in the middle of a line you saw him rehearse do this, you could guarantee every time he would do this. He was technically, as so was Marty Landau, technically very proficient. But he would he would say. Great. Now, what if I try this? And then he would show me what he was going to do. So I knew he was going to go to the to the door because my camera had to follow him to the door. So so he he rehearsed it going to the door. So he was wonderful to work with. So David Caruso, you know, he was good looking and he had talent. And but I've had other actors who I thought were good looking and talent, and they never did it. And they never worked more than one day in their life, one film in their life. And others that I thought, ah, I don't know about this guy became superstar. So Darby was in that picture. And again, I was lucky enough next the year after that, I did about one a year for 25 years. Uh, after that, I did a picture called The Return. And there was a good part for Darby in that. He is loose. When I was little, I saw the strangest, most beautiful lights in the sky. What the hell? I don't see a thing up there, Wayne, old buddy. But no one would believe me. They wouldn't believe me either. used to leading scientists run through the streets of my town. 
I didn't fall asleep at the wheel. A dog or something jumped on the hood. I heard we got a cattle mutilation right here in Little Creek. Yeah, same thing, different cattle. It's the fourth one we found today. I tell you, these cattle mutilations, is everyone all worked up and bent out of shape. It's just a monitoring device. It's human mutilations now. I don't think we ought to be shooting our mouth off about this in town. Sure. Hold on to your pants, everybody. It's as though someone left us a calling card. Mutilated! Miss me what a They wanted to keep track of us, and they needed me. You were chosen long ago. Chosen? You rode a horse in that, did you not, Darby? No, I don't think I rode a horse in that. Okay. This was my, I think, the last time on the ship. I had just, I think I just torn some uh, yes, yes. ligaments you, you, in my leg. You had a bum knee. I remember that. Yeah, I had torn some ligament, and I, you know, I was just starting to walk again. And so Crane's like, all right, now you're going to run down this alley, and you're going to tackle uh, Civil Shepherd. And if you could, just roll over, land on the ground. Oh, and we're going to have the rain machines on, so you're going to be a little wet and cold. But like, you got to love show business. Well, well, I, I think you know this, but what happened is oftentimes I would forget to get a stunt double for some. Uh, <laughs> Had nothing to do with budget. He just <laughs> kind of forgot to get them. Because that, that, something that I felt was a, minor stunt you know i i would think that the actor would do it so sybil shepherd was in this and she was very sweet very nice i like sybil a lot uh <laughs> and uh we're ready to do the scene and i said okay so sybil you're gonna run down and she turned around and she said where's my stunt double and i said oh sybil i'm sorry my god i forgot uh, uh, she said, I said, but I'll tell you what, the actor, because she had already done a couple of scenes with Darby. The actor, Darby, that you know, he's a long time friend of mine, and I've done dozens of pictures with him. And uh, he's very, very safe and protective. So I'm going to have him grab you from behind while you're running, twist you around, and he's going to fall back onto the cement and you'll fall on his chest. It'll be very easy to do. <laughs> she said, okay. So then I go to Darby and I say, Darby, here's what you have to do. You have to grab her from the back, turn her around and fall on the cement, protecting her. I said, Darby, have you been limping? <laughs> is, your, is your leg okay? And then he told me that he just, I think, had you had surgery or something on the left? Oh, yeah, I, I was barely walking, but it, it, the show must go on. Absolutely. So, so then, so I say to Darby, look, Sybil's concerned about this. Go over and tell her how you'll be able to do this. She won't touch the cement. It'll all be on you. And you're looking forward to have her jump on your body. <laughs> so, so he went over. I don't know what he said, but she agreed to do it. I said, I'd love for you to jump on my body. Today, I'd be arrested for that. But back then, it was an OK right. thing to say. So so we did the scene, and it worked well. And thank you, Darby. Because... Now, you forget. You, now, see, to Gray, it doesn't matter because he's shooting. He's on the set, and that's all he cares about. He, is, he has failed to mention that it is now about 3.30 in the morning. Oh, yes, it was late in the morning. Oh, oh yeah, no. And we, you know, we've been working on the, it. The rain machines had already been on, so we're already wet and cold and everything. And <clears throat> Sybil does turn to me before, right before Graydon's ready to. And first of all, I'm thinking, okay, I have to run and not look like I'm limping. You know, th that was my biggest concern. <laughs> and she turned, no, we really shouldn't be doing this. Th this should definitely be a stunt. I'm like, don't promise it'll, you'll be okay. It'll, let's just get out of here so we can go home. And then we ran and did it, and um, she thanked me afterwards, and it, yeah. it was 
Oh, it was nice. Good. Now, I did share this picture earlier on Facebook, but I got to bring it up again because when I looked at it, this is Graydon telling Sybil where to hit me with a two by four. <laughs> now, you just come across his face here, but look at that look on Graydon's face. He's like so happy that this is about to happen. And usually I would come in a little bit closer, but I love the other actor who was also in High Riders. Yeah. He's looking with a, an expression on his face like, what? <laughs> You're going to do what? And Grace, like, no, just go ahead and hit him here. You'll be fine. The hat will protect him. <laughs> <laughs> so did she really hit you with it or did she do the oh, whole yeah. swing by the no, no. head? She oh, really no. <laughs> oh, no, no. There's, there's... But he's not telling you that it was balsa wood so that it oh. would break easily. And, 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 and right just, after that scene that, that she hits him, then runs away, and then he runs, catches her and pulls her down. And and just so you know, Gray, on, on the Bob Cook film I did, the screen test, we had a scene where this girl comes up and she gets mad at me and she needs to slap me in the face. And she hadn't done much before either. And she's like, oh, I'm somewhere. I said, no, no, you can hit me and hit me, you know, hit me hard, but just hit me here. Whatever you do, please don't hit me in the ear. My hearing's bad enough. So just you hit me here, you'll be fine. Uh, so I said, no, you, know, you can give me a good slap. We'll, it will be okay. We stand up, boom, she boxes my ear. Just I'm like, oh, she, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. That's okay. Of course, Bob wants take two. I said, no, please, just hit the cheek. As hard as you want, but just the cheek, okay? Yeah, 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 yeah. Action, boom, she boxes my ear again. I'm like, Shit. It's sitting here ringing, I'm like, Oh, you got to love showbiz. Yeah. Well, that that picture, uh, I had a difficult time with the lead actor. He's no longer with us. Uh, Jan Michael Vincent. Very nice guy. Oh, great. Whatever you wanted. Uh, but by noon, he was stoned. Uh, well, oh, you're such a nice guy, great. Whatever you want to do. So it's I had a lot of other really good actors uh, uh, oh, you had some great ones. But here, I got this for you, Gray. And I found this one picture. And I actually think that this might have been from when he came out of his dressing room, fell flat on his face. And Graydon had to turn to everybody and say, that's a wrap, everybody. We yeah. can go home. Yeah. Jan was. Uh... This is Jan here. Yeah. This is me going. Oh, yeah. Wait a minute, we got scenes to do. Yeah, yeah. Jan was a nice guy, really nice guy. But he had the monkey on his back. When we finished the picture, uh, you know, then I went into the editing room and a month or so later, uh, I have actors back to redo some dialogue. Maybe a plane had gone over or whatever. I had to uh, loop dialogue. Uh, and you do that in a sound stage. So I contacted Jan's agent, he in town, yes, he's in town. Okay, Kevin report to such and such a stage at such and such time. So I'm there and in walks Jan Michael Vincent, clear eyed, bushy tailed, enthusiastic. Great and great and great. Let me apologize to you tremendously for the way I was when we were filming. I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm so sorry. I said, Jan. You look terrific. He said, I just got back from Mexico where I took the cure. I haven't had any drugs, no alcohol, nothing for at least a month. I feel great. Well, and I, I said, Jan, congratulations. Take care of yourself. And uh, let's do this dialogue replacement that we needed to do. And of course, unfortunately, within a matter of months, he was uh, causing problems on set. He was a big star at the, at the time I used him. He had just Alex Alex Cord will never forgive him for killing Airwolf. Of course, of course. He had a top series, everything else. Yeah, but yeah. He, and uh, uh, he, you know, I got I got to tell you, I don't know if I ever told you this. Great in my life, there's only two actors that I was ever jealous of, and and one was Nick Nolte. Yeah, you know, he was a blonde, good-looking guy. I thought had a great career. He looked a little interesting at the end of his career yeah. and everything. And the other was Jan Michael Vincent. Yeah. When he came out in Hooper, 
on the electric skateboard, which nobody had, or the motorized skateboard, nobody had back then. But when he came out in that scene, getting to work with um, um, Burt Reynolds, Burt Reynolds, and every, I was like, the only two people I was jealous of. And then later in life, I'm not so jealous. Oh, no, he had a very sad life. And uh, uh, I, I read an interview he did maybe a year or two before he died. He had lost a leg from diabetes. He, he, he was a mess. And he was living in, I want to say, the New Orleans area. And he said to the guy doing the interview, all I ever wanted to be was a drunk. And I succeeded at that. Mm. There's a guy that had the world by the tail. Oh, and by the tail. You know, Haggerty was a really good friend of his and, and, you know, kept in touch with him all the way up to the end. And yeah, he not only had that leg amputated once, he didn't take care of it. And they had to go back and amputate more oh. of it because oh. stuff was so, I mean, oh. talk about how far can you fall? Because you're right. He had Hollywood by the tail at that oh, point. Oh, he did. And, and, you know, he, he again was the kind of actor that just showed up, said his lines, but by noon, I would have to sit him in a chair to do a scene because he couldn't, he couldn't walk and talk. Anyhow, okay, moving on. Moving well, on. I have a question for you, Graydon, because you, just reading through your book, you were a very calm director and to work with amateurs and things like that, did you ever have a time where you really like blew your top, like you really exploded and was just really <laughs> at your wit's end because they weren't listening. I, I would say often every night when I got home. <laughs> you took it out on your wife. Oh, that's well, great. Because, because, you know, uh, <laughs> I was always on a limited budget. Now limited, by that I mean this. If I had scheduled to do a picture in two weeks, three weeks, later on four weeks, I didn't have a studio to go back to and say, oh, gee, I'm sorry. I had trouble with the actor. I need an extra day or two. That was it. That was it. I, I, so I, I had to always make the decision, is this good enough? See, if I had one more take on Derby, I could make it better. Oh, well, I can't do it. I got to move on. Is this good enough? What, if I had another camera angle, I could use that editorially. To, ah, I can't do it. I got to go on. So I, if I blew my top at an actor, especially, that would be stupid because they could say, the hell with that guy, and then purposely do whatever. Mm -hmm. I, had a, I had a guy who worked with me on a number of films named Whitney Hunter. Uh, Darby knows him. He was with, with us in Russia. Yep. And I used to, when, when, when an actor or somebody was doing something, I would scream and yell at Whitney. So the, uh, and Whitney knew that, you know, I was, I was, I was showcasing something. I really wanted to yell at an actor because he couldn't get his lines or he wasn't doing his whatever, but I wouldn't yell at him because I was afraid I had more problems. So I would yell at Whitney about something in front of the actor. And, and that worked often for me and well because i gotta say in all the pictures i worked with gray and then even when i was blessed and he let me come on and and help put together uh when we did star games and and, and oh i gotta tell that story um we'll get there we, darby we're just uh, staying, we're staying in order we'll get to star games so let's stay okay. in order all right <laughs> what where are we then in the, but no i have never seen Graydon losing on the set and i noticed in the book when i that i just read of yours that you even quoted me that i told you i mean things would come up that other directors would just explode and have a hissy fit and yell at everybody and everything and grain would just okay well let's move on and yeah. what are we going to do next and he just kept that level head and that's why all these great actors he talks about you know i was worried they wouldn't work with me again they came back and worked with him because he they was did. yes you know even though the you only gave us one maybe two takes oh yeah but you were always considerate you're always polite and the set was run nicely well thank you darby that's nice to hear i'm glad you feel that way so <laughs> if i may let me move on to wacko okay uh, I, after, after making these two horror films without warning and the return, 
I wanted to do a comedy because I love comedy. It's my favorite thing to do. And I always put as much comedic stuff in all my films as I could, which is why I kept casting Derby. So anyhow, uh, <laughs> I had a little money then because Without Warring was a good size hit and the return was very good in the foreign markets. Raymond Burr, that's the actor I couldn't remember from the return, uh, you know, colossal actor in a lot of ways. So anyhow, I, 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 I start reading scripts, comedy scripts. I, I put out a word to agents. I want a comedy horror film. So I got scripts, scripts, scripts. I read and I read one that eventually I filmed as Wacko and I thought it was wonderful. I thought it was great. So I got that and I started casting and I, I got down, Darby wasn't available. I got down to two actors for the lead kid guy and two actresses for the young, they were supposed to be high school students, although they were both in their twenties. So <laughs> I call him back in and one of them is James Spader and another is, hey, they, let, let me jump to IMDb and get his name. He worked quite a bit and he was very good. Anyhow, so it was down between James Spader and this other young actor and I kept calling him back in and I, had, I would have him read with the women. The women was Julia Duffy and Julia Louis Dreyfus. Really? And she ended up with a career. I'm not sure what happened to her. <laughs> but anyhow, I had her come back in two or three times. And I would have him read with the other kid, the other guy, and back and forth, back and forth. So finally, I decided uh, not to cast James Spader and not to cast Julia Louis Dreyfus. So although I did cast uh, Julia Duffy, who won an Emmy for New Art. Ladies and gentlemen, an important announcement from Academy Award winning actor, Mr. George Kennedy. One very serious point. Lawnmowers do not kill people. People kill people. Wacko, wacko, wacko. At last, a motion picture made by, for, and about people just like you and me. Damien, how many times have I told you this is not a toy? a phone message for you. Oh, wow. From Norman? Oh, wow. He didn't say. Oh, come on, Mom. What did he say? Well, at first he goes, uh, your daughter's gonna die tonight. Then he says, um, <laughs> oh, wow. Far out. <laughs> Police business? I'd like to have a few words with you. I'll never forget the first time I saw your father. If I'm rambling on too much, <laughs> just let me know. Uh, not at all. <laughs> wacko, wacko, wacko! At last, a motion picture made by, for, and about people just like you and me. We make Wacko, first day of filming, Darby, I don't know if he called me or I heard he was back. I called, I said, Darby, I've already cast everything. You're a little too old now to play a high school kid, but I've got a young cop. It's only one day. I'll do it. He says, I'll do it. Okay. So we're out at the uh, Veterans uh, Hospital in uh, West LA. Darby's there in a black and uh, blue uniform with a hat. And Joe Don Baker is playing the lead. <laughs> and, uh, I'm on a crane and Joe Don pulls up in his car. We crane him over to where Darby is investigating this uh, escape from a mental institution. And he's there with uh, Joe Don 
And uh, Joe Don, while we're rehearsing, Joe Don grabs him by the neck and t- t- turns him around and uh, uh, s- shouts in his face. And, and Dar- Darby, I'm, I'm sorry, sir. I'm sorry, sir. Nice scene. Wish he had more in it, but it was it was good to work with him again. And you know, it was really funny. We shot that at the VA center. Yeah. And I was dressed in the full LAPD, you know, just decked out. And during the break of lunch, I kind of wandered over to the commissary at the VA center and was just seeing what they had in there. And I was feeling kind of, hey, you know, this is like what a cop feels like. And, you know, it was interesting to see the reaction in the room, people with this and that. I'm like, ah, ha, ha. And all of a sudden, this guy comes up and grabs me. You, you have to come here. I'm like, oh, shoot. <laughs> What's going on? He goes, you have to give that guy a ticket. I'm like, what? That person, he parked outside in the red. I got a ticket there last week. You have to give him a ticket now. I'm like, wait, wait, I'm not really. And I realized that I better get the heck out of there because they really thought I was a cop. And I'm like, I'm sorry, don't do tickets and uh, escape. But I, that was so funny. He came up and he was just adamant that I had to give that person a ticket because he got one last week. <laughs> and Darby would have looked at that time because it was uh, uh, within a year or two, very similar to that picture right behind him from Without Warning. Yep. Scott McGinnis, oh. is that the other one? Oh, thank you. Uh, Scott, I apologize. Uh, uh, yes, Scott was very, very good. And uh, I used him in my next picture, Joysticks. It's, that's where I used the van that uh, uh, Darby had got from me. And Darby had put in the van a hot tub in, in, in the, in the uh, back area of the van. So he could drive the car wherever he was driving. But in the back, I don't know what you use that for, Derby. But anyhow, <laughs> in the what? back, he actually had a hot tub with water filled in. And when, when he told me about it, I said, look, do me a favor. Let me shoot it. So he brought it down to the set that I shot it. And I had a kid fall in it. So on. So, so there, Darby and I... And I don't know why, I don't know why, we lost contact with one another for, I don't know, five, six, seven years. And uh, uh, when I look back on it, there was really only one picture that I did that Darby would have been perfect for. And why the hell I didn't think of him and cast him in it, I have no idea. And which one was that? That was Skinheads. Ah, you would have been great as the young college student who encounters these racist Nazi bastards and uh, is the hero of the show. And, uh, you know, anyhow, uh, if I could go back and do it again. So then time goes by. I make a picture for Menachem Golan. Uh, It achieves some success, made a lot of money for Menachem. And Menachem wants me to go to Russia to make a picture, which I write a script and go to Russia and make this picture for him. Uh, I only took Robert England and four or five young dancers. It was a dance horror movie. Uh, So there was nothing in there for Derby. Then I go to Moscow for uh, Menachem. I come home, I decide to do another picture and I write a script and I'm able to take two American actors with me to St. Petersburg. And I'm thinking, who can I get to play the lead in this picture? It's a good part and it needs a real charismatic leading man. You know a guy. (laughs) And and my wife said, because she was with me on a lot for all these years and had worked in films and whatever with Darby. She said, what about Darby? I said, Darby, I wonder if he's still alive. So I call, I get Darby and I say, Darby, would you go to Russia? He said, Graydon, you tell me where to go, I'll go. So I was lucky enough to get him uh, and he was wonderful in the picture. It's a, it's a good little picture. Uh, and he played- on Dark like, Future? Is that Dark the one Future? we're up to yeah. is Dark Future? Yes. He was the leading man, the good guy, as he always should be. Uh, And we were there in October, November in St. Petersburg, Russia. 
It's so cold. You can't imagine how cold it was. Uh, we're, we're talking the night shoots. It would get down to minus 23 degrees. The camera, the, the, the uh, oil in the camera would freeze. And we'd have to replace it like every 10 minutes. We'd and they would try to put the high. big lights right up against the camera to keep it going. Yeah. And I, I remember I was doing one close up for you and I started talking and I started talking. And I, <laughs> my jaw had literally like, for, and I never felt so bad for an actress. Yeah. It was actually during the day, but it was extremely cold. It was still minus something, I don't know, minus 10, yeah, 12 right. or something. But we had this young actress, a a Andrea and, and Andrea Mann. Andrea. And she had to come out. And this is finally when we come from the underground. And now we're out in the real world. And we run, we jump on a wagon with horses and we take off. And she is in this little skirt with just a short sleeve shirt. And I mean, and I'm like, and I'm in a pea coat. I got silk underwear. I mean, I'm like, but love like, great, this poor woman. She's she's gonna freeze, especially when we get on there in the wind and everything. She's gonna freeze. And great just says, cold does not transfer to film. That's right. <laughs> I'll, I'll say this: she was wonderful to work with. I've never had a problem with an actor other than Jan Michael, and I don't consider him a problem. I consider the drugs the problem. But I never had a problem with an actor uh, refusing to do something or or be unkind or or anything. Uh, in that scene, that you're there's been a couple that were hesitant on the sex scenes, but hesitant, they still did it. Yeah. What about the, the girl in the ankle? One way oh, back. Oh, like, you had to get wanted to take the ambulance to the. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> because oh. she twisted her ankle and it wasn't available for you. Stop. She, this this poor girl she was <laughs> i think i would have killed her in the next scene or my husband would have killed her off in the next scene yeah, except we film so much out of sequence we can't do that <laughs> this this goes back to without warning i know i'm jumping around a bit here uh in my book called on the cheap i go in chronological order <laughs> yeah <laughs> so uh when i was filming a scene where two stunt people were jumping off a bridge into water. Uh, and I had an ambulance standing by just in case something went wrong. And I had two scuba divers, because there were two people jumping in, two scuba divers underwater ready, ready to go to them if there was a problem. So while we're setting all this up, I never wasted time on a set, I was always doing something. So I get my two leads, this young woman and young guy, the part that Dar Darby should have done, but he was out sailing around the world. Uh, uh, so I have them run. It's nighttime in the woods. I have them run from point A to point B. We rehearse it. Everything's fine. Action. She run. Suddenly I hear a blood curdling scream. <laughs> what the hell is wrong? I, I cut. We go to her. She's lying in sand, gripping her ankle. She says, I've twisted my ankle. It may be broken. And now I had a paramedic on the set, uh, the ambulance driver, in fact, two paramedics, one driver and one paramedic. So I called them over. I said, look, look at her ankle. What's the story? They looked at it and they said, well, it looks like a sprain. I don't see anything. And they moved it a bit, and it, you know, oh. So she said, I want to go to the hospital. I said, okay. So she demanded that I put her in the ambulance, <laughs> take her to the hospital. Wouldn't take a regular car. <laughs> oh, no. So I, I say to the crew, take lunch now. So I go with her to the hospital. I wait while she's being examined by the ER doctor. And uh, he comes out from the uh, room where he was examining her. And I say, what's the story? He said, it's a mild sprain. Tape it up. She'll be good as ever. So I go to her and I say, well, the doctor says you're okay. She said, take me home. I'm not going to, I'm not going to work. I'm not going to work. Take me home. I said, well, okay. If, if you insist, I will. We even had a driver for her, which I very seldom did, but uh, Tara was her name, Tara Nutter. So 
uh, I had her driver take her home. And I finished the night as best I could. We were filming nights. So the next morning, I go to my office and I called Tara. I said, Tara, how are you feeling? You have a call tonight for six o'clock. She said, I'm not coming in. I went to my doctor and he says, I can't walk on it for at least 10 days. I said, Tara, well, I, I, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, I said, look, I have insurance on you. You know, you always get cast and director insurance in case something happens, so you have to shut down. You, you don't have to blow the picture up. I said, so I'll put in a, a claim to the insurance company, but they're going to want their doctor to examine you. And if he examines you and he says, this is bullshit, you, you should work, you know, you're going to have to work. I don't care. I don't want anybody to examine me except my own doctor. I said, well, look, I'll put the claim into the insurance company. Luckily, the night before, I had finished Jack Palance, Martin Landau, and Neville Brand, and Ralph Meeker. I shot them all out, so I didn't need to bring them back. So we were down about a week. I put the uh, insurance claim in. The insurance paid me. Of course, I had a really large deductible, but what can you do? So that's that. Now let's get back to Darby. I guess she never worked on a Graydon Clark film again, huh? I think she only worked one other film again. <laughs> never to be heard of again. Uh, so, so uh, fast forward to Dark Future with Dark Darby. Future, colder than you could possibly imagine. And I, what I did is, it was supposed to take place at night, so or an underground uh, uh, compound, so that you never saw the sky. So I devised a way that we would shoot half days interior and then half nights, we'd break for lunch. So when we broke for lunch, everybody put on their, their sweatshirt, their outer jacket, their outer, outer jacket, the outer, outer jacket, a pair of Levi's, a pair of sweatpants. A, and it was so cold. Like Darby says, the, the poor young lady who was the leading lady uh, Andrea Mann, I believe, uh, she, you know, I would have somebody with a big coat just off camera, uh, half a step off camera, and I would say, okay, we're ready, roll camera, Andrea, step in, they'd take the coat on, she'd step in, do her same cut, and they'd come and put the coat on her. duplicate the human brain. They still have human desires, human wants. No, my baby, no! This can't be. We, we don't die. Welcome to the club. This has never happened to us before. We were told that we yeah, were Yeah, we were told wrong. This is what the world used to be like, outside the barrier. There's nothing beyond the barrier but the patrons. Believe me, it's true. We act as if nothing unusual happened. Great having seconds. you here. Right. Love it. A Nero 5 and a Hagen 4. Like me, I'm a Nero. He's a Hagen. Next time they'll send an army. Nobody who's tried it has survived. Why does the barrier keep us in and them not? We have kept us our entire life. This is never gonna work. This will work. It's gotta work. They're machines. Humans made them. Humans can destroy them. We are not made of steel and wire like them. We can have children just the way our parents did and their parents before them. The human race will not die out. Don't you understand? When the synthetics come back, they will murder all of us just to burn this child. Take the child to the extraction room. You've already broken the rules. Your day is done, old man. We're free. Free, 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 But uh, Darby was very good in that picture. One of my favorites. It was fun. I remember one, one interesting 
you know, because you only brought over a couple of crew members. So right. the stunts and the special effects were all Russian. And we had this one scene where they blow up the bar that I'm working in. Yeah. And, you know, Grain's all right. And you duck down here. And, you know, Grain always made sure it was safe. And everything. oh, yeah, yeah, there'll be an explosion. Well, as you know, Ginger, when we do explosions here in Hollywood, there's an air ram that goes and blows dust and debris up. And there's, you know, balsa things flying around. So we go, okay, you know, roll it. I duck down. This prop guy lets off a half a stick of dynamite <laughs> with real stuff all over. But I mean, it's wonder I have any hearing left at all. I'm like, what the hell was that? <laughs> and then the other time, we had the the stunt guy, and he really wanted to impress, you know, Graydon, because Graydon's, you know, the big Hollywood director and everything. And we have this scene where I'm supposed to shoot the alien, and I get the laser gun, and I shoot him. And he goes, oh, great. We can have the explosion go out here, and we can have the explosion go out the back, you know, because he had seen Wild Bunch or something, and I just thought that was the way. And Graydon was like, no, no, no. I'm just going to shoot you from the front. Don't worry about it. We, I just need to see the one in front and everything. And he's like, no, but I can. You know, that's okay. Just rig him that. And also, I'm sure he was charging per squib, too. So yeah. that was another thing. <laughs> we go ahead and we shoot this. And it was a Russian actor, you know, that was the thing. And I shoot him. And he's like, oh, and he lands on the ground. He's like, oh. And I'm like, God, this guy's good. You know, he's rolled around in pain. And he's like, oh, my God. And then they grain yells cut. And they rush in with the fire extinguishers because his suit caught, started caught on fire and everything. Now, I know in your book, you said they forgot to put the panel in. Yes, they did. I heard that he did. He put one in the back. Oh, maybe. he still yeah. wanted it. But he put it in backwards. Huh. So that when it went off, instead of exploding the blood and everything out from the suit, it just, it shot it right into his back. Yeah. It just burned his oil and caught on fire. And it was a good actor, scene. This actor, uh, when I called cut, at the crew, the Russian crew went to him and we found what had happened. It, the, the explosion exploded right into his stomach. And uh, uh, are you okay? Are you okay? He was a very good guy. Uh, all the Russians, I, I love them all. They were all great. The, you know, the government obviously is beyond <laughs> terrible, but but the people were all wonderful. So uh, Julian was his name. So I, I said, okay, uh, take him back. We're done with him for the night. So they told me later that they took him back into the dressing room. He seemed okay, and suddenly he fainted completely it, because it dawned on him what had happened. So. That was an interesting picture. So that was well, yeah. well, we also have to say about the Russian actors, too, is they did have a way of coping with the cold. Yes. <laughs> and that was from the morning with the cup of coffee and the makeup chair, it was half vodka. <laughs> yes. Yes. And, 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 and the crew, especially, because they were out at night. Uh, we, we, we tried to keep it to like six hours in the daylight inside and six hours at night. So, because 12 hours is normal work, right? So, so. Uh, On a Greg and Clark film. <laughs> so, uh, That's a good day. Uh, yeah. That, yeah, right. That, that picture was successful enough that I decided to do another picture. And I wanted to do a kid picture, a family picture, which I had never done. So I wrote a script, which eventually became Star Games. Uh, about two boys, I happen to have two boys, one 10 and one 13, who get involved. One of them is an alien from another world, and one is a, an American kid, and they get involved in an in a, in a, uh, adventure. So I have a good part of a, of a uh, 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 ranger. Ranger, excuse me, forest ranger. Uh, and I think. Darby be perfect because I just worked with Darby. So, so I contact Darby. Darby, we're going back. This time, we're not going to Russia. We're going to Bulgaria. Oh. Darby says, okay. So I tried to get my production manager, Whitney Hunter, 
to come with me to Bulgaria. But Whitney was busy on another picture. So Darby calls and says, are you taking any crew people? And I said, well, I was going to take Whitney, but he's not. Darby says, why don't you let me be the production manager, assistant director? He said, I've only been in this business 50 years. I think I should know something. And I said, Darby, I'd love, would you do it? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so Darby and I go over in pre-production to Bulgaria. And we're, you know, finding the studio and the sets and the camera crew. Excuse me, I brought Nick von Sternberg, my cameraman. But uh, the assistant camera and the gaffers and so forth. And Darby is a tremendous help for me. And Darby's role is two people. One, the forest ranger, and two, the alien monster who is kidnapping the uh, alien kid, that the 13-year-old kid, uh, excuse me, the 10-year-old kid, the younger kid, and going to take him back to wherever he came from. So Darby has a transition when he's the forest ranger, excuse me, into the bad guy and i don't know how he's going to do it so i say okay let's take a look at this darby how I, so darby takes a step out of one and then i'm going to do a slow dissolve into another and he twists his head and he plays with his beard and i'm thinking jesus this guy's pretty good he knows what he's doing <laughs> so that was that and he was wonderful in it and i like the picture I live on a planet called Arascon. We are led by our king. The king is also my grandfather. That makes me a prince. Nowhere in the galaxy is the young prince safe from me. Looks like Lugos had me, but I had a trick ready for him. We beat at last. It's a hologram. He's getting away in the pod. We picked up a distress signal from the young prince. It comes from an insignificant world, yes, and we... Yes. The blue planet. The inhabitants call it Earth. Brian! You're a strange dude, aren't you? So you're lost too? My grandfather's searching for me. You'll be all right, Laura. He's got a good head on his shoulders. If you are viewing this hologram, my grandson is in imminent danger. Lugos is evil and wicked, and is intent on universal domination. No planet in the galaxy is safe. Happy, come in. This is Brian. Hello, B -b 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 Brian. How's this gonna help? You may find me not as easy to trick. The planet Earth is such a violent little place. All the more reason that we must go. My grandson is there. Oh, no, you don't understand. He was telling the truth. It was, it was so fun to do it. And I, I, I got to say, and somewhere I have a video of it, but it's probably on VHS or, or something that hasn't gotten transferred over because I don't know where it is. But one of my things that we needed to do is this whole story was hinged on the fact that this family is having a picnic in the woods and a bear comes in and separates the kids off into the forest from the parents. So we need a bear. We need a train bear. And we were assured before we ever got on an airplane, we have lots of train bears nowhere. Even I think you were thinking of Russia, but no, Bulgaria, they promised we have bears. So one of the things Gray gave me was, you know, casting. I got to cast a lot of the extras and the, and the people working. And then I kept saying, and I'd love to see the bear. And it kept getting put off and put off and put. And I'm like, you know, if it's that easy, I'll, I'll go to wherever the bear is. But let me see the bear. They finally bring the bear to the set that we're supposed to work with. And it was a big, nice size bear, but it had a big old brass ring through its nose that they ran a chain through. And this is how the bear got from point A to point B was going along that chain. And we're like, um, 
the bear is supposed to be coming out of the woods to scare the, we, we can't have the chance. Oh, you can CGI it, or I don't even think they had a word for it back then, but you can take it out in post, right? right. And of course, back then it was frame, it was not as computers, it was frame by frame. And I mean, to do that would have been most of the budget right there. We're like, that can't work. Oh, don't worry, we'll get you something, we'll get you something, we'll get you something. Gray and I had some things. What could we do? Well, maybe if we got a close up of a head or something. Oh, we got a great bear costume. We have, we'll bring this bear costume. It'll work. You do it. So we're out shooting, and the guy shows up on the set with the bear outfit and he starts to get out of the car. I'm like, no, no, no. Just stay there for a minute. All right. Just before you go see Gray, just stay there. And I ran to whatever production truck we had and I grabbed my video camera because I'm like, I got to get this on film. And the guy shows up in this bear outfit that we're going to use. And it's a Yogi bear outfit. I mean, it is an outfit you would take to a kid's party. (laughs) And so the kids would be worried. (laughs) And we're like, oh, my God. But Gray, like you said, he was like, yeah, that's not going to work. Okay, where, you know, and he was on to the next shot. I was like, and the other thing where Gray kept his cool, and I really almost did lose his one that few times and it wasn't on the set it wasn't anything else we were all coming home we had spent i don't know how many hours flying from here to there and also we were probably 20 hours flying in the plane we get back to los angeles and we go to get all our bags out and customs has now stopped us they flagged us no 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 you have to go and actually my bags went through so i could have gone but i'm like no what's up because they stopped grading it and his because he had the film canisters And this custom guy just had it in his bonnet that this was something you didn't declare that this should be on your customs declaration. And Grant's like, no, we bought the film before we left. We took it with us. We filmed it and we're just bringing it back. Well, you need a value added tax. I was like, excuse me. (laughs) Well, you know, you've added value. You've shot a movie on it right now. Now it's worth a lot of money. You got to declare all that and you got to pay taxes on it. I'm like, well, how much do you think the movie? And Graydon was very nice. I think he saw I was, and he pulls me back and Graydon dealt with him. But I was just, I couldn't believe it. This guy was like, no, you have to pay tax on this movie for the value you've added to it. (laughs) The guy, the customs guy, I don't know, maybe he didn't like movies or people that made movies or whatever. But I knew the law because I had made a couple in Russia and, you know, this was Bulgaria. And I knew the law. And the law is, if you purchase your film in America, you take it someplace, you do something to it, you bring it back, they cannot assess a value. So there's no tax to it. But the guy then thought, well, they're smuggling drugs or something. Because I had boxes, you know, 10 by 10 feet of film uh, stacked up that were reels of film. He said, we're going to go through every one of those boxes. So he, I said, well, how long would that take? He said, you have to leave it here overnight. Hey, hey. So we did. Now, let me tell you about the bear. Darby's right. <laughs> uh, in Bulgaria, I had been promised a bear. And uh, we would even drive down the street when we were in the city. And there would be bears, dancing bears, but they all had this big nose ring. (laughs) So they thought that's what I wanted. All right. So I'm there in Bulgaria and I say, this isn't going to work. I'm never going to get this. So I say, I know what I'll do. I'll split the sequences. Here I will film. The, The whole movie was supposed to take place in America. Here I will film the Bulgarian part of America. Then when I get back to Los Angeles, I'll get a trained bear from an animal uh, actor's place and I will film the bear part. So I've got to devise, how do I do this? Okay, well, if the actors are over here, I'll film them with on a, on a lake in Bulgaria at a picnic. And then I'll have... The actor run out of Bulgaria and he will run into Los Angeles. (laughs) (laughs) So I devised this in my mind and I say, that'll work. 
So I was playing the father and my wife was playing the mother of the boy. So I, I say, I have the boy run off camera and then I'm chasing the boy. So I run off camera here and I realize I know what I'll do. When I get to America, I'll stop and I'll turn and I'll throw the keys back to the car because I would have them in my pocket as I ran into the woods looking for my son. So I run out in Bulgaria <laughs> and then in Bulgaria, I have the keys come flying in that I'm going to throw from Los Angeles. Does that make sense? <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> it well, does. It was a very wide shot. But we go out to see up at Fraser Park, the animal park, where they have all these trained animals. Once we get back to Los Angeles. Once we get back to Los Angeles. And it, and it does look good, except for it's got that California brown that we all have. In Bulgaria, everything was green. So the day we go to shoot this, you know, I come out and I'm finally like, you know, because usually I don't like having people on the set when I'm working because you're working. But this was going to be working with animals. It was going to be fun. So I finally say to my oldest kid at the time, who was probably about 10, hey, you want to come out with the set today? I think it'll be an interesting day. You'll probably enjoy it. He's like, yeah, sure. Come on. So we get out there. And once I get out there, I have the big can with the green dye in it with animal <laughs> um, food coloring dye in it and stuff. And I'm pumping it up. And I'm spraying all the bushes and weeds that are brown, green, to make it look like Bulgaria. And I'm going around. And my son comes up and goes, Dad, Dad, is this what a producer does? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, yes, son. Every day before the shoot, Spielberg is out there spraying the set just to make sure it looks good. <laughs> so uh, in the movie, the bear chases the 13-year-old my actual son. And I needed a shot of the bear and my son in the frame. Otherwise, you're cheating. So, so I say to the animal trainer, how safe is this? Because, you know, what if my son trips and falls while the bear is chasing him? So the animal trainer says, well, you see that guy there? And it's one of his that He has a big billy club. He says, you see this guy here? And he has a rifle. He said, if there's any possibility that an actor will be touched unknowingly by the bear, will kill the bear. I said, that's your bear, right? Yes. I said, you really will do that? He said, yes. So we got the shot, which was the bear running, chasing, and they got within two or three feet uh, and, and the cameraman was behind the bear, so we would get both both moving shots. And the guy with the gun was running behind, and the guy with the billy club was running behind. It was a little bit harrowing. I knew before I went to Bulgaria that I wanted to put a name actor in the movie, but I couldn't afford to send him to Bulgaria. So I said, okay, I'm gonna film everything in Bulgaria. When I got there, I realized I also had to film the bear back here. But I had always planned to film the grandfather of the space kid who comes and saves the day. Uh, I had to film him back in Los Angeles. So the agent said, how about Robert Vaughn, man from Uncle? Oh, that'd be pretty good. Yeah, but, you know, let me see what else I get. Then... Uh, a couple of other, uh, Kevin McCarthy. How about Kevin McCarthy? Um, yeah, I think Robert Vaughn's a little bit bigger name, but the, all of them are good actors. Then I get a call. How about Tony Curtis? Mm. I said, Tony Curtis? <laughs> He'd be great. Get, will he do it for 10000 No, he wants thirty. Thirty thousand. I didn't have $30,000 because I'd spent all my money on in Bulgaria and the damn bear. So, so, boy, I'd really like to work with Tony Curtis. I mean, he's a major star. You know, you get Tony Curtis, everybody, everybody knows who Tony Curtis is. I decide I'll sell my car to get the extra 20,000. And my wife says, you sell your car? What are we going to do? I said, well, we'll lease one. So I sell my car, I get the 30 grand, 
and I get Tony Curtis. So I called Darby. Darby, we're finally, and this, this took a year of editing and special effects and so forth. Darby, we're finally ready, and I have Tony Curtis. Oh, God, that's great, great, that's great. So will you come down and help me uh, the weekend? Of course I'll come down. So we're, on, we're shooting Tony against a blue screen. Everything in the movie that Tony is in is an optical with a blue screen in the background, whether it's in outer space or in the green greenery of uh, Bulgaria. So Darby comes down. Again, a more helpful guy you can't imagine. Uh, Darby was there as the producer, one of the producers of the film, and uh, he helped with Tony. Uh, Tony comes in. Well, actually, Darby and I and Tony first met a few days prior to that at Western Costume because we had to get the wardrobe for Tony because he's playing a, a king from another galaxy. So uh, we're Darby's there helping me manage with Tony. Tony's very cooperative. Let me just let me just tell a story of that. So we go to Western Costume that I had been going to since they were fitting me in diapers, yeah. okay? I mean, I, this is a place I knew, they knew me and everything. And I go in, oh, oh hi, I'm here, you know, we're gonna meet with Tony. Oh, Tony Curtis, just come with me. And they take me to the back room where I had never been, but you go in there and there's a bar and there's all the luxury things. And this is where the stars of stars go to get fitted. And Tony sat on the couch, how you do? He's very nice, very polite. I had left something in the car and all of a sudden there was a knock on the door and my wife came in and said, oh, Darby here, I think you need this and gave me something. Well, as soon as she came in the room, Tony jumped to his feet. How do you do? Shook hands. I mean, could not be a politer, more professional, wonderful actor. That's what I'll yes. say. We were there for a couple of hours while we uh, found the wardrobe for Tony. And then uh, I said to Tony, okay, you're scheduled. It was a Saturday, Sunday. Uh, it was during school. So I had to have a Saturday, Sunday to, to get my kids available. The studio was also cheaper on the weekend too. Probably, yeah. So Tony shows up with his wife who looks like Marilyn Monroe. Blonde hair, boozy. <laughs> kind of a flip look that Marilyn often wore and uh, a skirt that was barely covering anything. Yes. That was made of feathers. Yes. And, and, and Tony introduced her, I forget, Jill, I think her name was. Tony uh, says, so Graydon, you told me that we were going to do this whole thing against a blue screen. That's right, Tony. We have it set up here. And, uh, uh, he said, you know, there's a lot of dialogue. I want cue cards. I said, oh, okay, because cue cards never bothered me. Uh, if an actor wants them, fine, I don't care. Just say the words that we want to be said. And if that's the way it has to be done, it has to be done. So, but he didn't give us any notice. So, so I said to Darby and a couple other people that are there helping me, you got to go get big white boards and we got a black marker the lines that tony has to say and tony was probably in his 70s pushing mid 70s maybe by then and uh, i was concerned he couldn't see uh, because the character wasn't wearing glasses so i said tony can you see this i had a sample made he said yeah that's no problem uh, my eyesight is perfect so we, we got the cue cards and Tony did it and it was wonderful. And he was uh, charming, as Darby said, couldn't have been nicer. And then the next day, my kids were to work with him. So I said to him, as we were rapping, I said, Tony, it's been wonderful working with you. Now my boys are going to come tomorrow and uh, let's just hope they are controlled. And he said, don't worry about it, don't worry about it. The next day, Tony shows up. Of course, my kids are there. And uh, again, it's all against a blue screen. And I had to explain to the kids, well, no, you know, the, the woods, the Bulgarian woods and the spaceship and all that are going to be behind 
that when you see the finished film, oh, okay, okay. So my youngest at that time, probably 11, is playing the missing grandson that the King Tony has scoured the uh, uh, world or worlds to find. So Tony is there and I'm staging a scene where I have my young son, grandpa, grandpa, and he runs and he gets about two feet from him and he leaps off his feet and wraps his legs in one huge leap and Tony staggers back. And my son, who always had a way of saying things that he sometimes shouldn't, <laughs> he whispers to Tony, I hate you. Why the hell would he say that? I have no idea. So anyhow, we come back and I said, Tony, I'm so he said, no, no, that was great that he jumped at me. I just wasn't ready for it. Let's do it on film with him. And so I go to Tony because my son had said to me, I said to him, I hate you. So I go to Tony and I said, Tony, what my son said to you? He said, I know. He said, I love you. It was so wonderful. <laughs> Like a, a grandson would say to the grandfather, right? So Tony heard what he wanted to hear, I guess. Go ahead. One of my magic moments that I'll always remember was talking with Tony on the set that day. And here we all are on the green screen and stuff. Yeah. And there's his wife. And the reason I said she had feathers on her skirt, which you can't even see, yeah. is because they would float around and ruin the, green, the blue <laughs> screen. <laughs> but the crew didn't care. They loved looking at her. Yeah. But anyway, here, you know, here's Tony and here she is. And, you know, he looks at me when we're talking and he goes, yeah, yeah. The, the doctor said that sex could be dangerous. <laughs> and I said, well, if she dies, she dies. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, just to hear that joke from that legend, notice, I'll never forget it. Notice how Darby positioned himself right next to me. That way he knew he'd be in camera. The money shot. You taught me the money shot, Gray. <laughs> Got to know where the focus is. Oh, Gray, this has been such a wonderful trip uh, down memory lane. Yes. There was one other one that you mentioned in, in your book, and I didn't know that you got it too, but he said it to me. And that was this gentleman. When I was working with him, Ralph Meeker, yeah. award-winning actor, stage, everything, movies, and, you know, he's looking at us, well, you know, as soon as we're off this, it will be wondering if we'll ever work again. And I looked at him and goes, what? Because I never had that thought. I always was very fortunate. And, you know, I'd come off a ship, Graydon would call, or I, I always kind of, and I'm like, why would he say that? How could he say that? But it sticks with you every time you leave a production. Now you're like, well, wonder if we're ever going to work again. Ralph Meeker was in two films for me. He was in. Uh, uh, High Riders, Darby's first film with me. Wonderful guy. Uh, first day on the set, he he and uh, uh, drives up in a car. He gets out and he walks into a bar. And I know Mel Ferrar. He was Mel Ferrar. He he was walking, kind of unsteady. And I went to him to Ralph Meeker, who was walking unsteady, and I said, Ralph, uh, this is the first shot. I said, Ralph, everything okay? He said, yeah, great. And he said, I had a stroke about six months ago and I'm a little unsteady on my feet. He said, uh, but I looked at the script and I don't believe there's any running or chasing that I have to do. I said, no, 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 it'd be fine. I just wanted to make sure you, you were all right. So Ralph was wonderful in that movie. And a couple of years later, and without warning, I had Ralph, uh, sitting on a bar in a bar, uh, sitting on a bar stool in a bar. And, uh, you know, I filmed him. Uh, I think I only had him one day. And uh, at, at the end of the show, he said what Darby said. He came to me and he said, well, Green, now I ask myself what every actor asks after filming. Will I ever work again? And I thought, Jesus. What kind of business am I in? You got every time, every time you finish something, you got to start all over. Well, 
I hate to say it, but without warning was Mr. Meeker's last film because within a year or so he had passed on. I love it, Gray. You've been wonderful. I thank you so much. This has been, uh, this has really been a fun, fun trip. You, you've meant a lot to me all through my life. Um, and you're right. If you called up, I'd be, where are we going? What do you need? Let's get it done. And, you know, I got to tell you, um, I had so much fun with all the gorilla shoots, if you don't mind me calling those. Oh, absolutely. But that's, you know, that's what they were, you know. And then you get on some of these other ones, and, and I'm not saying I don't like doing the other ones, but you get on some of these other ones, like Dean was talking about, where, you know, you shoot it in three, maybe four, I don't know if we ever did a four weeks, maybe four weeks, and the other people take six months yeah. to shoot and you're just sitting there and there's so much downtime. There wasn't much downtime on your shoots and they sure were fun. And you had, but that was the thing. It was such a small little group that everybody was pulling to do everything they could to make it work. You know, Darby, sometimes <clears throat> critics will say not about my films particularly, but, but about any film. Uh, I look like they were just phoning it in. And I have to say, throughout my 30-year career, never once was I on a set where people were phoning it in. They were always trying to do the best they could do. Sometimes it didn't work, but that's another story. But they were trying to do the best they could do, work the hardest, and come up with the best product they could come. Even those crew members overseas. Yeah. That's the way they were. Like you said, the Russian totally third degree burns all over him yeah it was ready to get up and you know do you yeah. need a close-up yeah i mean it's it was it's truly amazing and it it's sure been fun and uh you know these pictures for me are like home movies yeah and uh going through them just seeing the different uh and i will say too on star games at one point you're like oh darby because it's kind of you know i know it's hard i tried directing something with my daughter once and when they're your own kids or anything else, but you, uh, you know, you let me sit there, you let me be behind, you know, here we are looking at the, the monitor. Yeah. And uh, you were even like, okay, Darv here, you, uh, you go ahead and direct these next couple of scenes. So, you know, when I say mentor and everything else, uh, you certainly were. And uh, I just love you for being such a wonderful part of my life. Well, the, the feeling goes double for me by, right back at you. So let's go make a movie. Hey, I'm all for it. Adios. I was going to say, so was Star Games your last film that you did? No, your last yes, year? I can tell you I left out a part of my life with Derby. So I finished Star Games, and uh, a couple of years later, I got the opportunity to direct a Mike Hammer television series. In fact, I did two of them. And the first one, uh, I was, I had never directed television. I always did my own movies, and Television was kind of a corporate thing and the director would just come in and, you know, say action and cut and that was about it. But uh, uh, I had this opportunity to direct uh, Stacy Keach and Mike Hammer. And I read the script, which was atrocious, uh, <laughs> but that's the way they were gonna do it. And I said, wait, wait, the lead character, the lead main bad guy that Mike Hammer's gonna uncover and do in i want darby hinton and the casting director said darby hinton i know darby hinton he's great i said good get him so they did and darby was i was lucky enough to direct him one more time that was that was fun up there and that studio would probably still be running if you had taken it over and run it <laughs> well it, it had a lot of problems there <laughs> But that, so know, so after my camera, you you were done? Did you just walk away from the business or well, what happened? I was getting older and it's a young, I used to say young man's business, but I don't do that anymore. It's a young person's business. <laughs> and uh, uh, I wrote my autobiography, which, uh, you know, people had asked me to do it for years and I, I didn't want to do it. You know, who the hell wants to read about some broken down uh, low budget filmmaker? But my kids, I had them late in life. So I was almost 40 before I had the first one. Uh, so they knew me, but not how it started and all the films I did before. 
so forth. So they convinced me, oh, dad, you got to write it. You got to write it. So I started writing it. And uh, I started writing in a normal autobiographical sense. And I'd, I'd write a few pages. I'd look up and I'd slipped into screenplay format. Screenplay format. And I thought, well, hell, I've written so many scripts. Uh, 20 that got made and maybe 10 or 15 that did not, never got made. So I thought, I'll write this script, uh, this autobiography in script format which is description of the scene, the character. And then when they speak, well, here, when they- The dialogue, here, I got one right here. Well, I got, I got a better one than you. <laughs> well, that's a script. This, this is, this is on the cheap. And it's written like a screenplay. And every one of my films is in it. And every film has a, color montage of scenes from that particular film. So I wrote it that way. And, you know, online, I don't have to tell you, everything is negative. Everybody hates everything. You know, they, they come out of the woodwork. But I have not had one negative comment on my book. Uh, I don't know why. I, I think that the people who are interested enough to go to my website and order it, are interested in what I did over those 25 years and the actors that I worked with and how I wrote the scripts and how I raised the money. Because I take each movie and I start with, where did the idea come from? How did I get the script? How did I get the financing? Which is always the most miserable part. How did I get the financing? Then. Pre Ginger would know nothing about that. I mean. <laughs> then pre-production, then casting, then production, then post-production, then distribution, and then the outcome of the film. And I do it on all 20 of my films, plus I do it on the my camera thing. And, uh, you know, response has been good. No, it's great. And like I said, I, I'm not a big reader. I don't. But I think the fact you had it in script form, because those I'm used to reading. Yes, right. <laughs> and right. sit down, it just made it fly through. And it, it was so and fun. And obviously, since you're talking about people that I know and remember, and yeah. I got the behind this, oh, that's why I didn't get Satan's cheerleaders. Oh, yes, right, okay. right. No. So, like I said, great. It, it has been a complete pleasure. You got to make sure to look me up when you come through L.A. I certainly will. And when I come through Vegas, um, much love to you, the boys, everybody. That's a secret lair. You're not supposed to tell anybody. <laughs> stay, stay back at you, Darb. All right. So uh, link me when you get this all put together. I will. And for our viewers, I apologize. We didn't get a chance to really read any of your questions. I think most of them. We're kind of answered, but we did. We I see we already have approached over two hours. Oh, you guys were absolutely fantastic. I'm going to drop in the trailers before we talk about yeah. talked about each movie, so people yeah. can get a little yeah. glimpse of some of the things you were oh, talking about. That's but. right. We had the trailer for High Riders, where they had that big explosion. My last story, because I'll never forget it. We're sitting there. It's the end of the day. The last shot. And they're going to blow up this whole gas storage yes. thing. And we're all sitting there. And I don't know if you had three or four cameras all around. And Grain's like, action. And we're all like, and nothing. Yeah. <laughs> nothing. And it was like, okay, that's a wrap. And I'm looking at this poor special effects guy that now has to go to a building full of gasoline and explosions and everything else. And find out where that short is. Yeah. <laughs> but we came back the next day and did it and it took off. Yeah. Okay, guys. Thank well, you. Anyways, thank you very much, Graydon, for being here and for your huge contribution to the, the movie making business um, and for your book. Your book really is very good. And for anybody who's interested in, in picking up a copy, it is available on Kindle as well. You can either go through his website at, I think it's GraydonClark.com com right yes right or you can order it on amazon um either a hard copy or a kindle copy which is also very good too so um good luck to you Graydon. i say good luck to you like <laughs> good luck
luck in your movie making future. Right, no. right, right. <laughs> all about luck. It's all about Anyways, luck. Anyways, thank right. you so much for being here. Really appreciate it, Darby. Thanks, nice guys. To see you. Everybody, and, thanks for coming, darlings and dudes. Night. Good night. <laughs>